start the recording right now. Um, so as of now, we are, we are recording. So everything that's being said is going to be held for posterity's sake. Um, okay, and I think that's, that's where we are. And with that, I'll, I'll open up with an introduction and then I'll, I'll pass things over, over to Olav. So it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Olav Rupel, who is the newest member of the academic staff of our, of our department. And welcome, Olav. It took quite a while for you to get here. I think you've been on the books for a month. Is it yeah. been long? Yeah, that's right. Uh, You've been here a lot longer than that. It took a long time for the paperwork to get through because everything is twice as challenging under COVID as it ever has been before. But I, I'm delighted that you're here and you're 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 not finding your way around. Uh, even though it's it's a weird time to be here, uh, it's, but it's a weird time to be anywhere. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I've just been um, approved to be on campus. So oh, I've there you go. So now you can actually see where you're going to work. Okay. Good. Um, so Olaf uh, was, was hired into a position uh, described as honeybee biology and health. So Olaf is, it specializes in the study of well honeybees, but he's, he's worked in many other, many other groups throughout his career of, of social insects. He originally did, he did his first degree uh, in Germany at the University of Würzburg, and he also did his PhD there where he, he worked on ants. And he's, so he's been working in social insects for almost 30 years um, and has evolved into being uh, more oriented towards bees, but I think you, you still have an open mind about other social insects. Um, did your PhD at Würzburg, did a postdoctoral fellow at UC Davis in entomology, which is I think where you started working on honeybees, if I'm, yep. if I'm correct. Um, and then took a faculty position at University of North Carolina Greensboro as an assistant professor and rose through the ranks there up until um, before he joined us, it was a uh, Florence Schaefer Distinguished Professor of Science at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in 2019. And of course, now he's here and he's, he's been appointed as a full professor from the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, Olaf has a distinguished career. He's many honors and, and uh, awards in research and in mentoring, which is, which is great to see. So he, he brings a lot to our department. He's published close to 100 peer review publications in, in, a, in a variety of, of, of venues in social insects, uh, dealing with um, health, genomics, uh, sociobiology, and, and uh, behavioral ecology of, of social insects. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the, uh, the screen over to Olaf, who will be sharing his screen to give his presentation. And the topic of his, his presentation is uh, the honeybee ovary. And if you look at the program or the uh, the advertisement that came with the the uh, you know advertising the chair's lecture, there's a link to a recent publication. I think that's tied to what he's going to talk about today. So with that, I will hand it over to to Olaf and please proceed and share your screen. Okay, thank you. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about some of my research. And I did um, deliberately choose sort of this uh, very um, general title um, because the honeybee ovary that you see here on your screen um, has a lot to do with um, various aspects of my research. Um, it also plays a central role in the social evolution, the biology, and even the health of the honeybees. Um, and so I can use that as a theme to cross-link a lot of things that I want to talk to you about today, some of which are sort of obvious functions of the ovary and some might be some more obscure, um, but I'll come to that later. So that just um, to this drawing, the honeybee ovary plays such an important role in my research that one of my grad students, former grad students, uh, Phoebe, um, here in the picture, um, has sort of given me this drawing here as a goodbye gift when I uh, departed for uh, Canada. And what you see is a honeybee queen ovary um, that is massively enlarged over sort of the regular ovaries of insects that you would see in, not in solitary or non-social um, insects. Each strand of these um, egg sacs here, the so-called ovarials, um, is basically a conveyor belt of egg manufacturing uh, tissue, and there are about 140 of those in each of the ovaries of the queen, um, and only 
um, vestigial two or three or four in worker ovaries. So the principal division of labor, the reproductive specialization of some individuals, but not others in the social insects is manifest in sort of the reproductive female reproductive organs. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, the ovary as an egg laying um, organ, of course, but also it ties to um, social evolution to the fundamental reproductive division of labor and um, some of the mechanisms that we think have um, occurred during social evolution. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, it ties to the division of labor even within um, societies and workers. And I'll talk about division of labor among honeybees um, and as my second chapter, if you will, in this talk. It ties to uh, longevity and um, aging. Honeybees and other social insects are very special in that there is no trade-off between reproduction and longevity. Instead, the reproductive individuals live much longer than the non-reproductive individuals. And we exploit that in our research, and I'm gonna talk about a specific study. And that is actually the study where I gave you basically a preprint, um, something that is in um, review uh, at the moment uh, to read if you want to read about the details more specifically. Then I'll um, sort of continue the thread of life history with um, a study on egg size plasticity and finally um, I'll finish with some uh, health honeybee health related study uh, because the honeybee ovary of course is also the central organ that we should be concerned about when we think about vertical uh, transmission of viruses and other diseases. So um, social evolution is of course a big topic and already um, Darwin was puzzled by the evolution of functionally sterile honeybee workers that never passed on their genes directly. Um, a puzzle that he did not solve but um, Bill Hamilton in, in the 1960s formalized the um, theory of kin selection and inclusive fitness th concepts um, that then basically um, explain this by indirect um, selection or um, genes being passed down by relatives. Um, and that is a great ultimate explanation, but it doesn't really uh, address the question of how um, social evolution has proceeded. So how a solitary, um, B here, a hypothetical, hypothetical example on the left, basically evolved into these so sophisticated societies um, with division of labor among different castes, but also division of labor within castes and cooperation as exemplified by this picture of the honeybee on the right here. Can you actually see my pointer or? Yes, okay, good. Um, all right. So this is where the reproductive ground plan hypothesis of social evolution comes in. And this hypothesis posits that the phenotypic plasticity that the solitary ancestor might have had uh, in circling between non-reproductive and reproductive phases in the life history, um, combined with physiological adjustments for egg laying, for mating, but also for provisioning young, um, so pollen foraging or protein foraging uh, versus um, non-reproductive survival and endurance mechanisms, basically where the ovary here that you see is atrophied largely and the individual just develops or, uh, or survives until the next reproductive bout. This phenotypic plasticity um, it posits was basically genetically assimilated um, into different castes, into phenotypic plasticity between different castes, most obviously between the reproductive queen castes that you see here on the bottom, again with an ovary dissected out, um, and the non-reproductive worker castes on top here, which still, as I said, have some small ovaries, um, but are functionally non-reproductive, at least when the queen is present. The reproductive ground plan hypothesis goes a step further and also um, explains within worker division of labor based on um, endocrine regulation and um, 
ovary sizes that are basically a symptom of these endocrine differences within workers in that more reproductively active workers would be doing sort of some of the nursing and brood care, alloparental brood care work, um, whereas the non-reproductive or the workers with smaller ovaries would um, specialize on foraging. And to take this basically to the last step, honeybees forage for different resources. Uh, honeybees forage for pollen, which is mainly the brood food proteinaceous source. Um, and they forage for nectar, which is converted into honey and then stored for the survival during dearth periods, including winter. And again, we can um, sort of suggest that um, the pollen specializing individuals are sort of the more reproductively tuned and the nectar foraging ones are the non so reproductively tuned, going back to that initial phenotypic plasticity in the ancestor. Um, and this is supported by a um, number of phenotypic correlations um, that have been come known as the pollen hoarding syndrome. Um, and I just sort of summarized a lot of these correlations here in this slide um, that range really from foraging specialization and, uh, and gustatory response scores to um, foraging onset and lifespan, life duration basically, uh, to reproductive and ovary size variables. So a large um, syndrome basically um, that fits sort of the bill of these uh, um, connections that have been suggested by the reproductive ground plan hypothesis. And these have been largely established by my postdoctoral um, mentor and then long-term collaborator, Robert Page. Um, and my role um, was to look at the genetic architecture of some of these traits. Um, and these are the traits that we specifically looked at. Um, and we identified several quantitative trait loci or QTL for these. Um, and then subsequently, basically based on those results and the phenotypic correlations, we set out to test the reproductive ground plan hypothesis um, genetically by, by testing whether there are direct genetic linkages at the QTL level between the behavioral effects of these QTLs and then um, behavioral effects extending to sort of the ovary um, size as a measure of the um, endocrine underlying pathways. And we used in one study at least the Africanized honeybee because the honeybee that is sort of non-domesticated and is very um, famous for its um, defensive behavior that you see here in the slide also um, mirrors a lot of the pollen hoarding syndrome as a naturally evolved sort of life history syndrome in these Africanized bees compared to European bees which are sort of more the domesticated version that the beekeepers are using all over the world. And so we started crossing these and the first um, sort of result that we got from this was a, a big surprise in the offspring. So you see the parental phenotypes here, the European honeybee on the left, the Africanized honeybee on the right. Africanized bees have a little bit larger ovaries um, and a whole slew of traits that goes along with this. And the offspring sh showed some phenotypes that we had never seen before in workers. Um, these are almost queen-like ovaries, basically. So strongly transgressive phenotypes, which was interesting in itself. because we think we discovered sort of some or revealed some um, hidden genetic variation uh, that was suppressed basically during evolution. But that's another story. Um, regardless of um, the transgressive phenotypes, what was most important for us was the genetic effect of these behavioral QTLs that we could see in these crosses, these back crosses. Um, and I show you just one example here, which affects basically um, the ovary size by six ovarials or six numbers of these um, tubes, which as you can see from the parental um, variation here is quite dramatic in normal phenotypic populations. So that was kind of a um, direct 
proof or support of the reproductive ground, ground plan hypothesis of social evolution at the genetic level. Turns out that a lot of these um, QTLs are containing um, genes that are involved in insulin-like signaling, in the insulin-like signaling pathway that I'm showing you here. Um, basically, everything that's color-coded falls into one of those behavioral QTLs. Um, and insulin-like signaling is, of course, one of the major endocrine uh, mechanisms and affects a lot of different things, including growth, lifespan, behavior, reproduction, and also in honeybees cast differentiation, but it's a very general um, and very pleiotropic pathway. So it does make sense that these genes might be involved in the pollen hoarding syndrome and the um, rewiring of the phenotypic plasticity um, during social evolution. Now I wanted to take that to the interspecific um, dimension as well. And so what you see here are um, not queens and workers, but actually workers of different honeybee species. So on the left, these small ones are aptly named dwarf honeybees, Apis florea, and they are sharing a leaf uh, here with uh, one worker of the giant honeybee, Apis dorsata. And these honeybees occur only in Southeast Asia, but you can see that um, there are dramatic differences in workers, in worker size, and then also in worker ovarial number or ovary size, um, while the queens are relatively similar. So the caste differences in these different species are very strongly diverged. And so we had the idea that we could look at genes for positive selection in the genomes of these different species and see whether we can support our insulin-like signaling hypothesis. And to cut a long project very short, we basically sequenced Apis florea and Apis dorsata and compared it then to the existing Apis mellifera, which is the Western honeybee genome. We used a bumblebee, Bombus impatiens, as an outgroup. And these are just some summary statistics here, but um, most importantly, we built um, some one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one -to -one ortho groups um, to look for um, molecular, or molecular evolution or signs of um, positive selection in um, the genes that we could basically um, assemble into ortho groups. There's also a number of lineage-specific genes here at the end, and I don't want to talk necessarily about those, but um, the signs of positive selection or the, the genes with positive selection, then we, we were trying to link back to the QTLs. Um, and the results are summarized in this table here. And I have to say it was a little bit disappointing because our Canada genes that we had um, sort of hoped for did not show up. So there are some genes that are under positive selection between the different species that we had um, uh, you know, located in these confidence intervals for these quantitative trait loci, um, but not really strong support for what we were looking for. Overall, uh, if you look at, um, there are about 100 genes or so positively selected in the different branches. Um, and we looked at gene ontology, and this is, these are just word clouds of these gene ontology terms that popped out. Um, and there are some things that make sense um, with body size and, and the lifestyle, um, but again, not a very strong support for our um, favorite hypothesis that insulin-like signaling was involved. And so there's more certainly to be learned um, about you know, castes and divergence and also the division of labor among workers. And that's sort of our next chapter basically that um, sort of looks in a little bit more proximate ways at the division of labor between these three groups that I've already mentioned, the nurse bees, the nectar foragers, and the pollen foragers. And I should mention that um, worker honeybees typically go through an age division of, age-based division of labor or progression from inside hive tasks, so from nursing to foraging. And then as foragers, they can, um, specialize or not a specialized, but most bees um, specialize into nectar foragers or pollen foragers. So there's also an age uh, difference between the nurse bees and the foragers, but not necessarily among the foragers. So um, one 
favorite hypothesis for what causes the division of labor among workers is the response threshold um, hypothesis um, based on the idea that individuals have different responsiveness to different task relevant stimuli. And uh, we can measure responsiveness to some of the stimuli by um, this assay that you see here on the right, which is called the proboscis extension reflex assay or PER assay. And it consists basically of um, tying down a bee into a little straw um, and then you can touch her antenna with sugar water, this is the sugar droplet that you see here on the right, um, and the bee cannot do anything uh, if she perceives the sucrose, then she sticks out her tongue or her proboscis, as you can see on the right hand side. So this is basically a reflex um, and it's very easy to measure or quantify then sucrose responses um, at different concentrations, for example, to measure the response thresholds. Um, and when we do that, um, we can see basically in two different species, um, Apis mellifera is abbreviated here as AML, and Apis serrana, another species that is domesticated in the Eastern Hemisphere more, uh, is um, abbreviated ACC. You can see basically over different sucrose concentrations how this is a dose-dependent de dose response. And the higher the sucrose co concentration, the more of the bees are showing this proboscis extension reflex. And you can also see that it depends on what behavioral task group we sampled from, and that the pollen, ho pollen foragers are actually the most responsive to sucrose, and then nectar foragers and nurse bees are not significantly different from each other in both different species. And then you can use different kinds of stimuli. So we can use um, not sucrose, but we can use pollen as a task relevant stimulus. And again, the pollen forages show um, a much higher responsiveness than the other two task groups, task groups in both species consistently. So now we could say, well, pollen forages are just responding ev to everything more. But when you use a third stimulus, and that's the larvae that the nurses are taking care of, the pattern reverses and the nurse bees are actually much more responsive in both species than the other, the foraging groups. So we see that there's some degree at least of task relevant stimulus responsiveness, supporting this uh, response threshold model of division of labor in honeybees. Now, mechanistically, um, we wanted to see whether we could link any neuropeptides to this. Uh, neuropeptides are relatively versatile and about 100 different uh, neuropeptides have been identified from honeybee, honeybees, so it, it was a good sort of class look at. And um, these are sort of an overview, uh, this is an overview of the results of differentially expressed neuropeptides in these six different groups of bees. Three different task groups times two different species makes six, six different groups. And I don't want to go through all the details, but highlighted here in red uh, are one group of neuropeptides, um, the tachininin uh, related peptides um, that fit sort of the behavioral patterns of these workers best uh, in their expression patterns. And so those were candidates for follow-up studies um, to see whether they would actually be causally involved. And tachininin related peptides are very general, uh, widespread throughout the bilaterians, um, neuropeptide in Drosophila. Um, they are located sort of throughout the brain but have specifically been linked to olfactor olfactorily um, sensitive neurons. Um, so it did make sense for them from a functional perspective also to be involved in sort of the tuning of response thresholds. And so uh, when we inject TRP or tachininin-related peptide to 
um, into these different task groups here, pollen foragers, nectar foragers, and nurse bees, we see that we specifically decrease um, the task relevant responsiveness. So nectar foragers and pollen foragers decrease their sucrose responsiveness, whereas nurse bees are not affected. Um, pollen foragers decrease their responsiveness to pollen, whereas the other two groups are not affected. And nurse bees decrease their responsiveness to uh, larvae, um, whereas the other two are not affected. And if you don't believe me with that um, evidence, we also did RNAi reduction or RNAi mediated inhibition of this TRP signaling pathway by injecting bees with either the tachyninin peptide or the, the receptor, basically. And in both cases, you can see that sucrose responsiveness in pollen foragers goes up when we inhibit tachyninin-related signaling. In nectar foragers, this goes up in both cases, but nurse bees are not affected. And the stimuli to pollen or the responsiveness to pollen goes up only in pollen foragers. The other two are not affected. And the responsiveness to larvae goes up in the nurse bees while the others are not affected. And so we think that is pretty good evidence that these um, tachyninin related peptides play a very important role in the division of labor. And specifically, they might be responsible for tuning the specificity of response thresholds. And with that, basically they tune how specialized the workers in a colony are. Now that might be an even more broadly applicable principle because other animals, of course, also have to tune their behavior towards certain situations or certain internal states. And so tachyninin might be really an interesting um, mechanism to look at uh, behavioral tuning in general. But to summarize this, basically, we see a hierarchical um, organization of the behavioral specialization among honeybee workers. I showed you sort of the influence of the ovary, maybe mediated at, the, at least at the intraspecific level through insulin-like signaling pathways and related hormonal pathways such as the ectosteroids or enbitalogenin. But then the brain comes into play and um, tachyninin and related peptides might play an important role in how much of specialization or how little of specialization there actually is in some circumstances or in different species. So I want to um, then go on to the next check the time here um, to the next um, topic real quick, um, and that is sort of the non-existent trade-off between reproduction and longevity. Here in a in a review, Jim Carrey basically um, highlighted this that all the queens, mainly the reprodu namely the reproductive individuals of social insects, outlive their workers by orders of magnitude, typically, and that's very unusual because typically there's a cost of uh, reproduction in terms of longevity throughout the animal kingdom. And so this has been addressed quite um, in numerous times in. Um, studies that compare the honeybee queen here with her workers that surround her. Um, and one of the central questions is really there, um, whether it is an intrinsic or a sort of a social facilitation mechanism, whether the queens are intrinsically more protected against um, factors that shorten our lives or whether they are just treated well um, in their protected colony and that's why they live much longer. But comparing workers and queens is sort of like comparing apples and oranges. And so we turned to comparing uh, workers with workers, but we made some workers reproductively active. And you can do that by taking away the queen. And then under that, those circumstances, um, some workers activate their ovaries and become reproductively active. And we had shown previously that they also live much longer than their non-reproductive workers. And specifically because stress resistance mechanisms are intimately linked to aging in a number of model organisms, we wanted to ask the questions, question whether reproductively active workers were 
um, more resistant to stress um, and surviving stress than non-reproductive workers. So our experiment compared these functionally sterile workers with small ovaries with reproductive workers that had their ovaries activated and were laying eggs. Um, just to show you sort of how the ovaries compare, basically this is an inactive ovary and this is an active ovary um, from the reproductive workers. And so we, we induced this by social manipulations, by having workers in um, queen right colonies with the presence of the queen or in queen less colonies on the right um, without a queen. And so we introduced individually marked um, bees into both of those social circumstances uh, so that we know exactly their age. And then we sampled them at two different time points, 15 days later or 25 days later, um, and subjected them to stressors or treat, um, treatments. We also collected some before stress uh, or other, any treatments were, um, were collect, administered um, so that we could compare sort of the um, pre-treatment queen right with the queen less um, workers. So to look at sort of that social effect of queen rightness versus queenlessness. And we've verified sort of that that led to reproductive activation. In blue here are the queenless colonies at after 15 days or after 25 days. You can see that there is an increase in ovary activation or ovary score. And then we administered um, two different stressors. One was abiotic, paraquat is a herbicide oxidative stressor. Um, and as a biotic stressor, we administered um, Israeli acute paralysis virus, which is an, a biotic stressor, obviously, um, and we had in our lab. And um, then we measured survival of these stressors. And you can see basically here that um, the thick black line, which are the um, paraquat exposed 15 day old control workers die much faster than all the other groups, which are either PBS injected instead of paraquat injected or reproductively active workers. And so um, the survival of paraquat is much higher when workers are reproductively activated. Um, and the same although not as clear cut, holds true for the survival of the Israeli acute paralysis virus. Um, again, the, um, the non-reproductive virus exposed uh, workers die fastest. So that confirmed basically our prediction that the reproductive activation would protect against um, different kinds of stressors. Um, we looked then at um, transcriptomes of these different groups. So first of all, the reproductive activation effect um, sort of changed in the abdomen of the sterile versus reproductive workers, about 2000 um, genes significantly. So this is just a scatter plot to show you here. There's a lot of upregulated, significantly upregulated and significantly downregulated genes. The exact identity doesn't matter, um, but there was um, a lot of adjustment, physiological adjustment during that time point. Um, and then the effect of paraquat um, on these transcriptomes um, was sort of the next step that we wanted to look at. If you compare this, these two graphs in the sterile workers and in the reproductively active workers, you see that there is basically no significantly differentially expressed um, gene here in the reproductively activated workers whereas paraquat did cause about 1,200 genes to be up or down regulated significantly uh, in the functionally sterile workers. So there's um, surprisingly, of course, uh, not surprisingly, of course, no um, differentially expressed gene overlap between um, these and these groups. But there's significant differentially expressed gene overlap between the reproductive activation effect and the paraquat effect. So genes that are upregulated um, by reproductive activation are also subsequently upregulated by paraquat in response to paraquat. So we think that, um, and there are some uh, important aging and stress resistant genes in, in these differentially expressed genes. So we think that reproductive activation is actually buffering against stress by sort of preemptively 
activating longevity assurance mechanisms, including stress resistance mechanisms. Um, and that was sort of exactly what we had predicted. And so it was a very satisfying um, result. Ultimately, of course, that is just a proximate mechanism. And ultimately, um, it's certainly true that sociality and social facilitation uh, feeding of the reproductive individuals does lead to resource transfers towards those individuals um, that then can affords them sort of the possibility of avoiding these life history trade-offs. Okay, so speaking of life history, um, egg size or offspring size is of course another of these um, key variables for life history and um, I was very skeptic at looking at um, in any variation in, in these eggs because they are laid by the queen. Forgot to mention, a queen can lay up to 2,000 eggs per day, uh, you know, one after one into these cells that you see here. Um, and then they um, stay there for three days, hatch, and over the next five days basically um, grow by orders of magnitude to fill the complete cell and pupate in the cell. And so there's a lot of strong um, parental care behavior by the workers that I thought would um, negate any potential adapt adaptive excise plasticity in honeybee workers. But we did look and um, my view was sort of quickly changed when we looked at different strains of honeybees and showed that the different strains have actually different egg sizes. So these are just sources here on, on the x-axis, but you can see that there's some differences in the size that these queens are producing. And then we looked, of course, at the other side of the coin um, at the env environmental factors. And uh, the first thing that we did was to basically deprive colonies of their protein source, the pollen that you see here, um, is basically shed by workers that want to bring it back into the hive, but can't bring it back through this mesh wire. And the mesh wire strips basically these pollen packages off them. So inside the hive, there's basically no pollen. And um, the other, the alternative was sort of to overfeed colonies. And as you can see here over this time period, the overfed colonies did not change um, their egg sizes, but the starved, the pollen restricted colonies increase their egg sizes. So the egg size was increased through pollen deprivation or protein so deprivation, something that was, was a little bit counterintuitive. And, it, and then we went on to colony size and compared different colony sizes. And again, we found significant differences. And again, I don't wanna pull um, the audience here online, but um, you know, again, we found something that I would have predicted in exactly the opposite in that the small colonies, queens in small colonies produce large eggs and queens in big colonies produce small eggs. And this is largely independent of egg number. We also measured how many eggs they, they laid in the, during these experimental assays. We did then uh, follow-up experiments to just show that this is actually real. Um, here are individual queens that were transferred from large colonies where they produce small eggs into small colonies where they produ produce large eggs. Um, and this summer we actually did um, um, a little bit more complicated uh, design where we had medium colonies. Some of those queens were moved into small colonies, some were moved into large colonies with the predicted responses being exactly observed. And then we inverse basically the social environment and you can see sort of the response followed shortly thereafter. Um, so we're fairly confident that this is a very robust um, response by the queens. And it does have some fitness consequences. So large eggs here in the dash line um, do give, give rise to uh, higher survival rates, although at later developmental style stages, surprisingly, not at the very early stages, than small eggs. And so that, that's an, another area that we're really interested in uh, and trying to follow up on um, with not only the quantity of what gets put into the egg, but also the quality um, of how these large and small eggs differ. At the moment, we can just say honeybee queens adjust sort of the egg size with consequences for off, offspring survival. Um, and that's all we can say at the moment. 
And um, sort of to bring this to a close, um, the last thing that I want to talk about is sort of the queen's role in um, virus transmission. Um, of course, honeybees live in these very tight um, societies with highly related individuals and horizontal virus transmission is a big issue. Um, it is also vectored by the varroa mite, which I have completely excluded today from my talk because I didn't want to be redundant with what I had presented last year. Um, but basically, uh, we also focus on um, the queen as the central hub for virus dissemination. So if you're a virus, it's great to be in a honeybee colony, but if, you're, if you can infect the queen, that's really sort of the jackpot uh, because the queen does produce all the eggs of the next generation. And um, so basically this might lead to more benign infections. The queens are rarely um, symptomatic, but of course then all of the offspring is infected. This infection route is not perfect, as you can see in this result graph. Um, here we have plotted basically the um, number of viruses of one particularly widespread virus, deformed wing virus, um, in the queen ovary, and then uh, relate that to the deformed wing virus quantities in the eggs that she lays. And you can see that most of these data points are below the diagonal here meaning that the queen ovary has more viruses that end up, than end up in her eggs. So the transmission is certainly not perfect. Um, and that has something to do with the particular transmission pathway of deformed wing virus, which we investigated as well. So viruses could come in theory, at least through the sperm um, into the offspring. They could come inside the eggs um, and passed on to the offspring, or they could just be around sort of the eggs in the ovary, um, and then being on the outside of the egg have the ability to infect the offspring um, after hatching. And so we distinguish these possibilities by uh, looking at eggs that are female destined versus male destined, drones are the male bees, um, and they emerge from unfertilized eggs. Forgot to mention this, this is a haplodiploid sex determination system, um, but workers are diploid and queens are diploid, so all females are diploid, and then the drones are haploid. Uh, so the drones are not fertilized, and if we see viruses through the sperm route here coming in, then the workers should have much higher virus titers than the drone eggs. Um, and then within the drone eggs, we looked at the comparison between non-sterilized and surface sterilized drones, because if we see a reduction of viruses through surface sterilization, then it is very likely that most of the viruses are on the outside of the egg. And that's basically what is um, sort of our result here. Worker eggs are relatively high in viruses, but drones are just as high once you first surface sterilize um, the virus titers drop off precipitately. Um, and this is a logarithmic axis here. So um, the, the difference is actually quite dramatic. So the virus is sitting on the outside of the egg um, and therefore doesn't get transmitted very, very well, but it still does. Um, it sits on the outside here. And our next question was sort of to see what um, is happening inside the egg when the virus is being passed on. So um, for that, we screen commercial uh, hives, uh, population of hives, you can see here, uh, and made based on the findings that we found only two different viruses, the form wing virus and sac boot virus in this particular population, we basically made four experimental treatment groups. Um, one group that was double infected, that had sac root virus and deformed wing virus. One group that had sac root virus, but not deformed wing virus. One group that had deformed wing virus, but not sac root virus. And then one group of um, colonies that had neither virus. And um, we basically collected a bunch of eggs, 100 eggs per colony, um, and then looked at the transcriptomes of these eggs. With the assumption that the viruses are on the outside, 
so that any transcriptome differences would be attributable to maternal infection status, basically, and the effects to the mother. And so these are the four different experimental groups, just in a different um, quantitative graph. Basically, here is the double infected uh, group, here is the sac root virus group, and here is the deformed wing virus group, and the clean group, basically. Um, and so we did all um, possible pairwise comparisons of the clean group with the other three experimental groups, if you will. Um, and we did not find a lot of significantly different, differentially expressed genes. So these are um, the results of the differentially expressed genes, but they are actually based on uncorrected p-values. If you go uh, by false discovery rate, this, these numbers drop down basically to a handful of genes. Um, and so while these handful of genes might be really important and really interesting, and we might be able to follow up on them, but we were um, a little bit sort of unsatisfied with that and um, decided to go and look for overall trends despite having relatively few um, genes differentially expressed. And there's an interesting analysis. Um, it's called uh, go Man whitney u test, basically. Um, and it is particularly suitable for those situations where you don't have a lot of differentially expressed genes, where you can do a traditional GO analysis with based on the DGs. Um, how this works is basically you have a list of genes here and different fold changes and whether they're significant or not, it doesn't really matter for this particular analysis, but you have to order this list based on signed p-values. So the p-values um, have to have sort of a positive or negative depending on which direction the fold change is uh, going on. And if you order this, then you have basically ranks of all the genes based on their signed p-values. And then you can do a rank order test um, of genes that belong to specific go terms and compare that to sort of neutral expectations. And so some go terms might be distributed across this list randomly, but others might cluster on either end of the distribution, either here or here. Then you can say, well, that these go terms are over enriched in up or down regulated genes. When you can do that, um, we did this and um, we did find then a lot of different go terms even though there were individually not very many genes significant, okay? And some of these go terms here, biological processes and molecular functions do make sense. Um, translation is upregulated um, with virus infection. Cell cycle processes are downregulated. This is in response to deformed wing virus. Um, similar picture in uh, response to sac root virus, even though there's more impact, more gene or gene ontologies uh, turn out to be significantly impacted. And interestingly, the double infection um, was, so here are some of the similar, very similar processes, but the double infection showed actually quite a lack of similar processes in these Go term analyses uh, with a single infection. So, um, hinting to the fact that, that double infections might synergize and, and affect, do very different effects than single virus infections. Anyway, so I think we're at the end of our time. And so, I just wanted to quickly summarize um, because I've touched on these very different topics um, that I showed you that the reproductive ground plan hypothesis indicates sort of this idea of phenotypic assimilation of temporal plasticity into caste differentiation and behavioral specialization, very much like Mary Jane with West Eberhardt sort of idea of the importance of phenotypic plasticity in evolution in general. Um, I showed you that so division of labor relies on task specific response thresholds and that the specificity is modulated by tachininin related signaling and I think tachininin might be worth uh, looking in more general terms in sort of for behavioral modulation. Um, I showed you that reproductive activation in honeybee workers protects against oxidative stress and viruses, um, and that the mechanism is sort of a preemptive activation of longevity assurance mechanisms, at least in part, not completely. Um, I showed you a study to um, 
find that found that honeybee queens adjust their egg sizes to the environment and colony conditions. There's also genetic variation likely, but um, it affects subsequent offspring survival. And um, lastly, I was mentioning sort of these studies that um, address the question how queens deal with viruses because they are central hubs, whether they can, you know, prime their offspring maybe for um, virus resistance um, because the egg transcriptomes are uh, impacted. Um, and so that goes into sort of more applied research of honeybee health. Of course, this research wasn't done all by myself. And so I want to acknowledge um, a number of um, people in my lab, collaborators, and also funding resources um, based on these different projects, different people were involved, different people funded it. And I thank you for sticking around. If you're still around, I can't see that. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. Um, wow, there's a, there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, yeah, and I see lots of applause, even if you can't hear it. So um, I, let me see how many people we've got. Okay, most, most of us are still here. Before, before people start to disappear, I'm just going to make a quick announcement, and then we'll, we'll take questions, um, lest I forget. So part of it is one of the things that we do at the end of a chair's lecture is we hand you your very own um, bottle, um, oh, water yeah. bottle, which okay. is the uh, Department of Biological Sciences Inspire Discovery for a Better World, very sought after water bottle. And we'll, I'll, I'll be sure that there is one available for you in the department. So thank you, that's, that's our, our gift. And I'd like to remind everybody before anybody takes off that um, the next lecture is uh, Anna Fan. Another new arrival will be on October 8th. So that is our next chair's lecture. So just in case people want to slip out during the question period, I just wanted to be sure that I, I pass it along. And, and with that, I'd like to open the floor to, to questions. And um, let me see. I don't know if we're going to use the chat or maybe if you could just, you know, turn your, turn your video on and wave your hand and we'll, we'll try to manage it that way maybe so that we can see you when you ask your question. Yeah, I'd prefer that because, I mean, obviously I haven't met very many and so I'd, I'd really like to sort of connect um, and I think we're a small enough group to have uh, people. I, I think that's a great idea. So uh, please. I yeah, see Declan. Uh, hi, so uh, great talk, Olaf. Um, it it uh, brings me back to some of my time. So when I did uh, my PhD, I actually worked, I worked on insects and so it, it Brings back memories, so um, thanks for that. I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll start with uh, maybe the easy one and then hopefully be able to ask the, the one that's a bit more involved. The first one is why are they called Africanized as opposed to African on Europe, European versus Europeanized bees? Yeah, that's, hmm. a, um, that's a good question. So the Africanized bees are not African um, because they are not directly uh, in Africa. So these bees are actually an interesting science story. Um, they were imported into Brazil by a Professor Kerr um, as a way to genetically improve the resident stocks of European bees that were coming from Europe um, because the tropical climates were not, uh, they were not doing so well in the tropical climates. Um, these Africanized or the African, those African bees escaped sort of a typical scientific Frankenstein story, escaped and did very well, but hybridized and basically converted most of the natural populations throughout South America and then um, Middle um, Central America up to uh, the US basically. Um, and so they are a mixture of genotypes with the dominant African phenotype. And that's why they're called Africanized. Um, okay. Because their phenotype is, is African-like, uh, I would say they're more wild type, um, you know, than than the ones that have been domesticated and are European in origin here. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and maybe my, if I can get to my next question, and that is, when you were looking at um, the differences within Europeptides and you focused on tachykinin, um, to what extent would you think, or do you know that? Um, peptides belonging to a group called fermerfamides or fermafamides are involved in any of the, the changes um, or the differences that you're seeing? Mm 
Um, it's not an involved question because I don't know enough about those um, peptides. I mean, basically um, what we did is just an MS um, comparison of all the neuropeptides and found that the, these two tachyninins were correlating with what we sort of saw behaviorally and then we just focused on them. I, I lack mechanistic understanding, I have to freely admit, basically of the details and what could make other good candidates. And that's certainly something where I wouldn't rely on collaborators. Okay, all right, thank you. You have any thoughts on that? I mean, or what well, maybe- yeah, so, so, Yeah, so I mean, so when I, um, when I was doing my, my PhD in the lab that, that, that I, I did it in, so uh, Ian Orch is at the University of Toronto, and he collaborated with someone called uh, Stephen Tobe. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with any of those names, but they looked, um, they looked at uh, the activity of a wide range of peptides on a number of different um, insect uh, systems. And one of the peptides or family of peptides that they found was involved in a huge range of things from muscle contraction, um, apart from things like proctolin, et cetera, um, are fermafamides. And they are peptides, so they're, they're smaller peptides, um, but the, the family can, there can be hundreds or thousands of members of the family and they, they are involved in, in, in a range of activities. And so I wouldn't actually be surprised if um, formaphamides are, or the members of that family are involved in um, some of the changes that you're seeing, um, especially with regard to development um, and possibly even the aging process. Uh, so that's kind of why I, I brought it up. But if you want, we can chat offline uh, about it. Yeah, it's it's a very new area that that I just basically got thrown into by some Chinese collaborators um, or with some Chinese collaborators that I've just started working with. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Hi, Olaf. It was a nice talk. Really nice talk. Um, I was uh, a little bit also, almost, I work with flies, so I'm a little jealous that we don't have like the specialized cast system, or at least not observable. So, um, but I, I was interested in the tachykinin story. Um, and so you showed that there were changes on the responsiveness to stimuli. Um, did you look at any other changes? Like, is it, a, do you think it would be like a master regulator and that like they would even behaviorally do different tasks? if you manipulated tachykinin or is it just the responsiveness to stimuli? Yeah, so I mean, this is all lab stuff. So the next um, step would really be to take that into a natural, more natural context and to see sort of what they're doing. My interpretation of the data that we have so far is really um, that it reduces the specificity of some stimuli that are typically, you know, highly eliciting a response uh, based on the tasks that the bees are doing. And, and so I'm at the moment, I'm seeing it not as an sort of instruction, do this or do that, but rather sort of, am I really focused or am I a more generalist, basically taking all the stimulus? I see. Well, uh, hi, Olaf. Nice hi. talk. I'm uh, sorry, I have a follow up question to that. <laughs> yeah. So it looks like um, your manipulation of the tachykinin um, receptor peptide. So it, I like with the application of the tachykinin, it reduces their specificity, and with the RNAi, it increases their specificity for the particular type of work that they are doing. So yeah. then, like, what are your thoughts on what is actually controlling their underlying, like, um, kind of uh, work preference? So is it like different neurons maybe that are either expressing or not expressing certain levels of the tachykinin receptor? Like, so, you know, like, if we can simplify it to the terms of like, oh, like a pollen preference group of neurons or, you know, a larvae preference group of neurons, like not that it's that simple. But. I mean, nines are, if I'm correctly informed, mostly in the mushroom bodies. So, I mean, it, it would make sense that they are involved in higher order processes. But 
what we see phenotypically so far is just sort of the modulation of responsiveness. And I, I mean, I don't have any neuron uh, level resolution or anything um, in honeybees, but um, I'd rather see it as sort of tuning of the um, input. I think that's where the processing of the input um, because we have other data from these PR studies that motivation or, or you know, um, physiological state affects the responsiveness. So if you're, if you're making bees hungry, basically, you know, they're responding much, much faster to sucrose, for example. And so I'm, I'm thinking that this is not a physiological modulator that is sort of very similar to, to hunger or um, age, but it is maybe a very specific modulator of the input that comes in, and how input might be prioritized in, in the olfactory neurons. But yeah. that's just- so Are you thinking that there is some underlying differences in the, the bees that then lead to this sort of preference? So, yeah, I mean, approximately, um, we know that the nurse bees are younger, right? And have higher vitellogenin titers. Um, so are nutritionally um, fatter, if you will. Um, and they convert some of this vitellogenin. It's, it's, it's strange because vitellogenin is an egg yolk protein that normally would be put into the eggs, but the workers don't produce any eggs. But basically they are using it to produce brood food to feed to the, to the, to the larvae. Um, and so that's sort of their, their physiological state is, is very different from the, from the foragers that are older and basically um, aged and physiologically um, and nutritionally kind of depauperate compared to the nurse bees. But at the neuronal level, I have I have no idea. So, um, you know, I mean, you can be envious about the plasticity of honeybees, but there are a lot of other disadvantages with honeybees that you, that you might not be so envious of. Thanks. Yeah. Although their brain is bigger than Drosophila brains, I have to say. So if you wanna take some bees into your labs, I'll be happy. Yeah, they're probably smarter too. <laughs> Sure. I have more questions if no one else has. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, great. So I was wondering, you know, you, you, you talked about the size of the eggs and the size of the colony. Um, in one sense, I guess it wasn't, I mean, I'm thinking about it afterwards, it wasn't as surprising to me that if you have a larger colony and you need to produce more animals and you only have a certain amount of resources that can go into each egg. And so maybe you have, few, you have uh, smaller eggs because you need to make more of them for the larger colony. But what, what I was wondering with regard to that was, during the, the day, and you mentioned that the, the, the queen bee will lay up to 2,000 eggs in a day. During yeah. the day, is there a difference in the fitness, um, the size or the quality of the eggs, even during an individual day? So as the female, let's say, undergoes different um, hormonal rhythms or rhythms of neurohormones or peptides throughout the day, does that affect the quality of the eggs from, let's say, morning to midday to nighttime? Yeah, we don't know. Um, what we do know is that within the colony, there is very little diurnal rhythms other than the food unpacking and storage. So all the food is stored uh, in the colony. The nurse bees have constant access to um, the, the food and the larvae that they need to feed, basically. Um, so there's no diurnal rhythm and, and their circadian clock actually only switches on when they become foragers or in that transition. So you can actually look at per, period gene and other genes and, and see that they are basically constant in expression in the nurses. And then when they make that transition towards foraging, then they suddenly become like rhythmic. Um, and and I, I would think that the queen has sort of the same um, arrhythmic biology, but I don't know that for sure. Okay, th thank you. Yeah, we quantified the eggs. I mean, so there's not a strict relation between size and number. Um, but 
maybe that has sort of a delayed effect. You know, during the assay, when we collected the eggs, we collected the number and, and size of eggs. And there is no strict relation, but maybe, you know, how many eggs they laid before or after affects how, how big the eggs are. That's certainly true. Yeah, Maya, do you have a question? Um, quick question. I was, I, I mean, I saw how you presented the sucrose to the antenna, but I'm wondering about how you presented the larva and whether or not the nurse bee um, response to the larval cues was a response to brood pheromone or if you had thought about testing that. And then my other question um, following up from Declan is, wouldn't the workers in small colonies produce fewer cells for the queens to lay eggs in in the first place? And so couldn't that be limiting what the queen is doing? Yeah. Um, so I'll take the second question first. Um, and yeah, there's certainly um, differences in the opportunity to lay eggs, but also in the queen makes decisions not only on the, based on the number of available cells, but also based on the worker population that is available to nurse her offspring. And, and so there's certainly, you know, there might be the, the, the physiological limitation of the queen um, that then forces the trade-off between size and number of eggs, right? That she is, despite being fed, she's physiologically, not, and despite having these great ovaries, she's not able to leave um, more biomass than a certain amount. And so if she's in large colonies, she reaches that limit and has to make her eggs smaller. Um, but you could also argue that in a large colony, the offspring is buffered better, fed better because there are no more nurses around, so she doesn't need to produce large eggs, whereas larger eggs might be a little bit more robust um, in, in, the, in the subsequent development, even if, it's, if, if the temperature goes up and down or it's not, the offspring is not fed as, as regularly as in a large colony. Um, the PR with the brood was actually a surprise you know, because I mean, when you touch an antenna with food, then an appetite of response is, is sort of what you would think is expected to happen. But with brood, why these nurses stick out their tongue is a little unclear, whether it's sort of a feeding response, I'll feed you or, or licking and cleaning response. But we did directly touch the, the larvae. And this is a first instar larvae, so a relatively small larvae to the antenna. So it's a physical contact. It's not, um, Okay. Restricted to the pheromones. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Olaf. Uh, I'm Ted. Uh, great talk. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, I have really just like sort of curiosity question. Uh, have you thought about other um, metrics of aging? I am I right in understanding that you mostly you've looked at survival? And I was wondering in particular about maybe um, measuring learning and memory or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you asked. And, and um, because we have done a study, um, that's now almost 15 years ago, but um, it turns out um, that, that um, functional senescence in worker bees is not really tied very closely to survival or chronological age. And that has to do with their division of labor and physiological relationships, but also mortality pressures outside the hive versus inside the hive, um, depending on whether they're foragers or not. Um, and so, yeah, there's no strict correlation of learning performance with, um, with age. In fact, in some instances, uh, the foragers, the old foragers are actually better learners than the nurse bees that are in, in the hive and younger. Um, so functional measures are a little bit problematic if, um, if they don't relate to, to survival probabilities or chronological age. But, so like with these very long aged um, queen bees um, have a good memory and learning ability or is that, are they too, inactive to really need that as part of their um, uh, survival, I guess. Yeah, cast ca comparisons between workers and queens are very interesting. Um, problematic because they differ in so many different ways, um, of course, as well. Um, 
and I'm not sure. I mean, honeybee queens are really precious, if you will, because you need a whole colony to get one queen basically um, as a study data point. So studies of individual queens are very labor intensive um, and therefore you see very little. And we have never tested them on, on PER or learning assays. I mean, this proboscis extension reflex can be used for classical conditioning, of course, um, you know, quite, quite readily and, and therefore learning can be assayed quite conveniently, but with queens, we've never done it. There's a study on ants um, where uh, workers also assume queen-like roles, basically, as a natural part of the life history. And there the brain shrinks um, when they uh, move from worker to queen status. Thanks a lot, that's cool. Yeah. How are folks doing? Do we have any, do we have any more questions for Olaf? Well, that's fantastic. Um, I, I want to thank you, Olaf. That was that was really great. Um, and remind everyone that our next our next speaker is Anna, and uh, Anna's here today. And I and I did get that right that you are next in in October. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll see that you get your much coveted biological sciences water bottle. Um, okay. I, yeah, I haven't seen good. very many on eBay, so uh, they must. Oh, <laughs> well, people keep them. Yeah. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, I hope to see you all soon. So uh, with that, it's a wrap. So thanks again, Olaf. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Olaf. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Dave, you know, I never got one of those mugs. One you never got one? Ones. No. <laughs> okay. I'll, I've got a call with um, Diane right now. So I will be sure you get one. <laughs> You're not lying. Are you? okay. You're not going to sell I'm it. I'm not lying. <laughs> no, I, w I was the second one. So I think Mike was the first. Oh. And then I was the second. And that probably didn't happen. start until later on. Oh, uh, you know, Declan, I'm, I think we can find one for you. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye. All right. Bye bye.